history? Probably when I was about three or four years old. Um, my grandfathers and grandmothers were very engaged in history and telling stories and my family's always been connected with history of, of South Carolina and you know every Sunday afternoon we would have elderly uncles and aunts to come over we'd go somewhere else and they'd sit out on the piazza and we'd talk about history and I'd listen you know I'd listen as a child and so they always talked about the old days and what went on and horse and buggy days and farming and all that so I, I really got interested as a child and then my great-grandmother's house was in Campobello, South Carolina, well, between Campobello and Grambling. And I can remember we would go up there on Sundays a lot of times. I'd go up with my grandparents and my parents, and as the adults were talking, I would be out rambling in the barns because they, it was an old farm that had lots of barns and outbuildings. So I spent a lot of time actually rambling and um, climbing over old farm equipment and looking at the mule-drawn wagons and plows and things like that and the tools in the blacksmith shop. and so. I really had a, an early appreciation for old things and also for history. And where did you grow up? I grew up in Spartanburg County uh, in Boiling Springs. Uh, my mother's family uh, has been in the Boiling Springs area since the 1750s, 60s. And then my father's family was from the Anderson, Abbeville Anderson area. So my grandmother and grandfather Drake uh, migrated to South Carolina during the Great Depression. Uh, my grandfather worked with the railroad, with Piedmont Northern, as his uncle did, and that's how they got there. And um, so they lived in Spartanburg, and the rest of their family lived in Anderson. So we would come, uh, some weekends we would come to Anderson, to Pendleton, over this way to visit relatives. And so that's where my love for this area started when I was a child, because half of my whole family was from this way, and then about half was from Spartanburg. And so you were interested very early. Did, it, did you start reading about and studying history and... and undergrad school or college or was it high school? When did you really get, kind of do a deep dive? As a child, I was always reading historical books. My father was kind of an amateur, I'd say, archaeologist. He was very, very interested in um, Indian artifacts, Native American uh, sites and lore. And so my father had a tremendous amount of history books related to the prehistory. Um, you know, I would read encyclopedias. Um, when I could get my hands on history books to check out, I would read those. So I guess from the earliest times, I've read about history and studied about history. And then when I got into high school, I became extremely interested in South Carolina history just because of all the family stories, our relationship as a family to John C. Calhoun and some of the other, um, I guess, movers and shakers in South Carolina history. It started to pique my curiosity. And I started doing research into our family and its influence in South Carolina, and that just grew. Um, especially with the Revolutionary War period. Uh, I, I was really interested in that Rev War period, the colonial period, um, up to the time of the war between the states. And, and then when you went to college, you studied something else, right? Well, I had basically, a, I could have had a minor in history as an undergraduate because I took a lot of history courses. Um, my major, I was, I was pre-med for three years and then I switched over to entomology in my fourth year. Um, I wanted to be a surgeon and I observed some surgeries and decided that wasn't going to be for me because I, I pass out when I see blood and I don't, also don't like needles. So my father was an entomologist and had a family business in Spartanburg and so I went into entomology. I'd always had an interest in science and insects and things so I sort of went into that so I could go into business with him. Uh, ended up get a master, getting a master's and a PhD in entomology so uh, that was another um, another interest. I knew that I could not go to college uh, major in history and really make a living. Um, you know, that's, I was told that at an early age, to go into history and to archaeology, you have to either be born very wealthy or want to be poor the rest of your life. So <laughs> I chose science. Do you, have you made connections in your mind, though, between that field and history? I mean, Oh, yes, it's, it's, I mean, it's very connected. I mean, you know, the science of, um, science is so inserted into history and history into science and religion into all of them that you can't really separate any of that. I mean, especially in South Carolina, the scientific research that went on with agricultural crops. Um, you know, Abbeville, South Carolina was at one time the cotton research um, center for the nation in the antebellum times. Cotton seeds were developed there that were shipped all over the, the nation uh, down through the cotton belt. Um, of course, you had the, the group up here in Pendleton uh, that had come up from Charleston, founded the Pendleton Farmer Society, and their, their main purpose for the first, well really until the college was founded, was agricultural research and demonstration. 
And so a lot of your planters, um, people who were uh, high-level historical figures and political figures in South Carolina also dabbled in science because they were first farmers. Uh, and they had to know the science, they had to know innovations in order to make profits on the farm. Um, we didn't have as much innovation in mechanical sciences here in South Carolina, uh, although we did have, you know, with Robert Mills and the canals and all these uh, types of innovations that came out after the 1820s to get the crops from the up country to the low country. You had a lot of engineering uh, marvels of the time that took place in the state, uh, and a lot of people have forgotten that, the canal systems, the early railroad systems, uh, but it all revolved around agriculture and getting those crops down to Charleston, which was losing crops because a lot of them were going down the Savannah River to Savannah, making Savannah rich. And so um, they had to figure out a way to reroute things, and through technology they did that. Were there some particular insects that changed history in South Carolina? Uh, probably the most, one, the most important one was the boll weevil. Um, our first report of a boll weevil in South Carolina was in 1917 on Defusky Island. Um, and that, it, they call it the Mexican, um, the Mexican boll weevil at the time. It had come up from Mexico. And um, from 1917 until around 1930, it completely devastated um, South Carolina's economy. Um, you know, uh, economy that had been pretty much a monoculture, cotton monoculture, was fairly well destroyed. And, and a lot of the great migration that took place uh, among blacks and whites during the early 20th century was, was because of the boll weevil, because the cotton crops were destroyed. Uh, there were also droughts that coincided with that that made it even worse. But because all they knew was farming, um, they had to go find jobs in factories and move away. So we had a lot of uh, people who had the great exodus out of South Carolina because of the boll weevil. And we really never recovered from the boll weevil in South Carolina. It did cause a diversification of crops, which was a good thing. Um, and we finally got the boll weevil eradicated in the 1980s. And we still have to this day a boll weevil eradication program that anybody who grows cotton has to pay an assessment um, for that trap and the monitoring of the crop because uh, it's one of those insects that we might not have it this year, but if you had a small pocket of it, it could be widespread two years from now and cause tremendous devastation. Uh, so uh, pesticides have helped out, but we still have to monitor and, and be vigilant for the boll weevil. Uh, it was the worst, uh, probably, insect, invasive insect we ever had to the economy. And, and you have a, a major voice in, like you're talking pesticides regulation now, working with the state, right? Are there yes, any insects I, now that could be as threatening to the South Carolina as, as the boll weevil or something else that is a threat? We have one right now that's in the low country. We actually have, uh, we have a federal and state quarantine in Charleston County, about 80 square miles now, I think, for an insect called the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, it's a borer, a cerambicid borer, a beautiful, beautiful beetle, but not beautiful if you have maple trees. Um, it attacks maples. It's not going to be that much of an economic problem in South Carolina, we believe, but it's a tremendous economic problem up in the Northeast where maples are their primary shade tree, the sugar industry. Um, maples in South Carolina are mainly ornamental, um, and we are a state that, we call them swamp maples, they grow in swampy areas. So economically, that beetle would impact us most in the export of wood products, the export of trees, nursery stock, to other areas that may be impacted by it. So it is a, it's a big potential for economic loss to South Carolina and we have an eradication program that started in Charleston I think 2019, 2018, 2019, somewhere in there uh, where we identified the first beetle. We think it had been there for about 15, 8 to, eight to 15 years already and um, had become widespread and that's why it's such a, uh, a difficulty to control it right now. Um, we've uh, contracted with tree companies to cut tens of thousands of trees already. Uh, there probably will be hundreds of thousands more to be cut. Um, all the host trees within a quarantine area have to be destroyed uh, so that beetle cannot. And once the tree is infested, there's nothing you can do to save the tree except to cut it down and destroy the tree. Um, it's, it's a pretty bad pest. So yeah, that one has some big potential here. We've got some we're looking out for um, that could cause economic problems in the state, but they haven't arrived, we don't think, thank goodness. The fire ant was another one that caused some major economic um, issues, primarily in agriculture uh, because of its impact to farm equipment. Um, cattle farming, you can have you know calves that are impacted by it. It impacted for a while the ground nesting birds. Um, 
uh, impacted the nursery industry. Shipment of nursery stock has to be guaranteed to be free of fire ants in order to leave South Carolina. So, um, yeah, those insect pests and also weed pests and pathogens that come in can be a, a tremendous hit to our economy. And that's what our division at Clemson, uh, Division of Regulatory Public Service Programs, our Department of Plant and Industry tries to guard against those types of things, uh, keep them out, and then once they get here, try to help eradicate them. Any hope on the fire ants front? No, they're here to stay. They're, they're um, you know, at once it was thought that they were impacted by soil type. We found that that's not really the case because they love the red clay of the upcountry just like the sand. It was thought that climate uh, temperature would uh, inhibit their movement, but it does some, but not as much as they had hoped. So it, fire ants have spread pretty much throughout the, the southeast and even into the, the northern uh, area of the south now. Um, so Do they have any natural enemies anywhere in the world? There is a forid fly. It's a little uh, parasitic fly that actually will uh, lay eggs in the fire ant's head and the head capsule will pop off. So it kills them that way, but those are native to South America. They've tried to introduce those here uh, and they have had some success in laboratory situations, but not a whole lot of success in the wild. So I, I think they're here to stay. So most of the problems we're having is stuff coming in inadvertently from other places. Yes, invasive species, plant, um, pathogen and insect invasive species and even animals are highly impactful to our native species. Um, you know, have plant species, for example, a lot of them have completely overtaken natural habitats. Um, kudzu, for example, that was brought in as an ornamental as early as the 1860s. People put it on their, on their porches for shade. Uh, the railroad started planting it on banks to prevent erosion, and then the Soil Conservation Service in the 1930s and 40s planted it on fallow, washed out farmland to control erosion, and it's just gotten out and gone rampant. Um, privet hedge brought here in colonial times uh, is terrible um, in the, the natural ecosystem. Uh, one of the more recent ones brought in is Bradford pear because it's grafted to the old calorie pear or spiny pear rootstock and so when it, it makes seed, those seed uh, generate the, the parent stock and it, it can cause some real bad problems uh, taking over fallow fields and and so we've declared that an invasive species, or South Carolina has now, and are discouraging anyone from planting that, get rid, getting rid of the ones they have. And I think actually it will be illegal to sell Bradford pear in South Carolina, um, I think it's 2024, 2025, that goes into effect. So we're talking about it's all connected to history. I, you, you, you've got so much time invested in that. Um, You've obviously also invested decades in study and continuing to study history. You mentioned Revolutionary War, and tell, tell me what your favorite parts to study are. Probably the early colonial up to Revolutionary War uh, social history. I'm, I'm more of a social history person than a Explain you know, to people battles. what that is if they don't know. Social history is the history that revolves around or is concentrated with people's beliefs, people's activities, uh, the way they live, the way they dress, what they ate. Uh, how they moved, why they moved, how they worshipped, um, which actually precipitated the wars that we had. Um, you know, people have not changed throughout time. But people, times change, but people don't. The, we have the same wants, desires, needs, uh, everything that our forebears did 10,000 years ago. Uh, but you know, it's interesting in this state in South Carolina, we had the blending of so many cultures early on that, that impacted the people we are today. We still have that blending going on now, but I don't think the blending is as impactful culturally as it was in the early days. You had uh, migration of the Scotch-Irish, uh, the English, the French. Of course, you've got a strong African influence. Uh, you've got the Native American influence. Uh, you've got German influence. You've got Swiss influence. So all those cultures came together and by the time you had that amalgamated culture uh, right after the revolution, um, pretty much the South Carolina culture in general incorporated a lot of those individual foods, uh, way, modes of dress, ways of farming, uh, beliefs to a large extent, um, superstitions. Um, you know, and to this very day, I mean, we have uh, white people who have uh, the same superstitions that were brought here by Africans from Africa in the, the 17th and 18th century. So our cultures have blended, our beliefs have blended, uh, and you know we were we were a society of great codependency. Uh, you know the 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 white um, free 
planters and the black enslaved people, um, the black freed people. I mean, they all depended on one another to make things work. And so I like how those, studying how those um, different cultures came together and made us what we are today, um, both in our actions, our desires for certain foods, our language, the way we talk, uh, and all that. And also climate had a tremendous impact on uh, South Carolina as a colony uh, and as a state in South Carolina. And entomology works into that. Um, we had tremendous, tremendous uh, disease problems in the low country from mosquito-borne diseases. They didn't know they were mosquito-borne at the time, but uh, things like yellow fever and malaria. Uh, mosquitoes are the most deadly creature that's ever inhabited the earth. They've killed more people than all the wars of, of humankind combined 10 times over. Uh, so you know, in South Carolina, life expectancy in the early days was very short, um, in the low country especially. And that's why the, the piazza we're sitting on now at Woodburn Plantation wouldn't have been here had it not been for malaria and yellow fever because the low country planters who could afford to leave Charleston and the, and the lower areas in the summertime got their families out because there was such a, um, a high probability of death uh, if you stayed there through the summer, especially for the white settlers because um, malaria killed them left and right, whereas your Africans who came to Charleston had what was called a sickle cell trait. And if you um, had the sickle cell trait but didn't have sickle cell anemia, that gave you some resistance to malaria. And so oftentimes the, uh, the blacks who stayed in Charleston through the summer did not face as high a mortality as the whites, although yellow fever killed both equally. Um, and, and the slaves often fell victim of yellow fever more because they were in those swampy areas where the, the Aedes aegypti that, that transmitted it lived uh, most. But you know, the, the planters came here, they established these upcountry summering spots uh, by the early 1800s, and so a lot of our population in the upcountry is sort of a blend of those low country planters who came up here and summered, and they would stay here from oh, around the middle of April, 1st of May, up until October, until they would go, and then they would go back to the, the plantations. And then you've got the migration of the Virginians who came down to South Carolina. A tremendous amount of our ancestors are Scotch-Irish Presbyterians that came down the Great Wagon Road from Pennsylvania and Virginia. So in Pendleton especially, in Andrew, what's now Anderson County, you had a tremendous blending of those low country families and the up country or the Virginians who moved in here. Who, and those families had been in Virginia uh, since the earliest days. Uh, my mother's ancestors in Spartanburg are descended from settlers of Jamestown in 1608. So um, my grandmother always said, as Southerners, we're descended from the oldest Americans because you have those Charlestonians that came there early on, the Cavaliers, and then you had the Virginians uh, who came down the, the wagon road and, and blended in the upcountry of South Carolina. And a lot of our culture is this, uh, sort of an amalgamation of that. Um, Revolutionary War, uh, if it had not been for the hatred the Scots-Irish had for the, the English, we probably wouldn't have won that war because it's, it's a well-known fact that the revolution uh, essentially was won. The turning point of the revolution was in the back country of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. Uh, the battles, especially Cowpens and Kings Mountain and some of the others, uh, turned the British north. Of course, Charleston was held until 17, what, 1781. Uh, when they took it in 1780, they held it for a year, no, till 82. Um, but, you know, the low country uh, was different. They were more English. The up country was Scotch-Irish. Uh, those Scotch-Irish had, had learned how to hunt in a lot of cases um, for survival because they didn't have the, the cattle of those in the low country, so if they wanted meat, they had to kill it. So the Scotch-Irish were very, very good marksmen, uh, and they didn't fight like gentlemen. You know, the, the British, the English would line up in a field, shoot at each other, fall back, Another one line was shooting, you know, that's because the, the muskets they had were not very accurate. So you had to have this wall of lead coming toward the opposing troops. Well, the Scotch-Irish typically used rifles because they had to make every piece of lead and every ounce of powder count. It was hard to get powder up here. You had to go all the way to Charleston or Augusta. So when you shot a gun, you wanted to make sure that powder counted. So therefore, they were excellent marksmen. And so you get a group of these militia together. I like the militia led by Andrew Pickens and, and, and Francis Marion and some of the other militia uh, generals. And those men knew how to hunt. They knew how to fight. Uh, and they did not fight like gentlemen. They hid behind trees, and they picked off officers first. And so when you're fighting against a British-trained force that is taught to always follow orders, when you kill the officer, which was never done intentionally in battle by gentlemen, 
Uh, but these scotch Irish would kill the officers, and the, a lot of times the soldier would scatter like chickens. They didn't know what to do. And so those tactics, I think, helped us win the war in the backcountry, uh, much more than was being done on the coast. So, yeah, that's sort of how your, uh, your culture, uh, I think, added in to, to helping to win the revolution. Are there any other distinctives of the upcountry as opposed to the other parts of South Carolina that are pretty much, you know, just uh, inculcated here? Gosh, we have so many. I mean, um, you yeah, know, the way we talk, the way upcountry Southerners talk is more derived from the Scots-Irish dialect than it is from the low country um, English dialect. Um, and, the, you know, that blend of English and French, uh, the foods we prefer. Um, everybody ate salt pork. That's about the only thing you had in the backcountry to eat meat-wise unless you killed fresh meat. And so, you know, that salt pork was a huge part of our diet. Um, People in the upcountry didn't eat as much rice as those in the low country. We ate more grits, um, you know, the ground corn, because we grow corn, we didn't grow rice here. It's hard to get rice to the upcountry, so you didn't have a lot of rice. The, that South Carolina rice culture didn't really come up this way until after the railroads, pretty much. Um, uh, everybody ate, everything was based on corn meals, hominy, grits, cornbread, uh, and to some extent, still native Southerners, we love our grits and cornbread and and all those things as well, um, corn fritters. And um, so, you know, some of the food ways are different. There was not as much influence in the upcountry early on from the African, African community as in the low country because we had pockets in the upcountry along the Savannah River, moving up to Anderson from Abbeville, those areas where you had some very large farms that had, um, or plantations uh, on which slaves operated. but. For the most part, the upcountry farmers, they were not a big slave culture. Um, so you didn't have that interaction with the African culture until later on, uh, sort of the end of the cotton era. Um, and you know, I, I do want to make one comment about the term plantation, and I, I must say this. It, automatically, people now associate the term plantation with slavery. And that, is, that should not be the case at all. Uh, we have different places renaming themselves because they were such and such plantation, now they have to be such and such farm or garden, like the Charleston Tea Garden. Well, it's because of the miseducation of a couple of generations of Americans. Plantation was a legal term used in land transactions. And you can see this in legal documents going all the way back almost to medieval England where the English legal term for a tract of land upon which crops were planted was a plantation. So in the early days of America, it didn't matter whether you had five acres or 5,000 acres. If it was a piece of agricultural land, it was called a plantation. Um, now, most plantations did not have the first slave on them. Uh, most plantations up here were small dirt farms that the people operated themselves with their sons and daughters. But I mean, there are land documents in my family and parts of my family that did not own slaves where the land, is, when it was transferred, was called a plantation, uh, any tract of land upon which something was planted. Um, so that, that is one term that throughout history has become a bit twisted from its original meaning. Now, planter had a distinctive link to slavery because to be a planter, a person had to be the master of 20 or more male slaves above the age of 16. So I think people have confused the term planter versus farmer with plantation. You could be a farmer and own a plantation, but if you were a planter, you would have had a one or many plantations in the large. So, so I, that's something that has, has, we've had to deal with here at the Historic Foundation because, because we call our, our, this is Woodburn Farm, but Ashtabula was known as a plantation. But, there are very few slaves that served on the plantations or worked on the plantations in the upcountry. Uh, so. What about the religious influence uh, of, on the upcountry, particularly over the years? Very, very strong Scotch-Irish Presbyterian influence uh, above Columbia, um, especially early on uh, in the pre-Revolutionary War days. Um, most of the settlers of the upcountry were Presbyterian. Uh, there were a few Baptists scattered in and about them. Uh, really were no Methodists until John Wesley and those came through to Savannah and later like the 1790s after the Revolution. So most of, of our religious beliefs in the upcountry of South Carolina 
are derived from those early Scotch-Irish Presbyterian values. And even most people who became Baptist or Methodist later started out as Presbyterian. Uh, below Columbia, you had a lot of Anglican influence, uh, Church of England, which after the Revolution became Episcopalian. But you had your strong Anglican influence there. And also in the, what we call the Dutch Fork, you had a lot of German Lutheran. Uh, so, and then French Huguenot as well. French Huguenot were primarily in the low country areas of Charleston, but also up around Abbeville, New Bordeaux. Uh, there were French Huguenots that moved in fairly early. So you have that blending. The, the Huguenots were followers of Calvin, John Calvin. The Presbyterians, of course, were John Knox, but they were very close in belief. So most of your Huguenots, or Huguenots, as they call them in France, eventually migrated to the Presbyterian faith. Um, and, you know, the Presbyterian faith early on emphasized a very Spartan lifestyle, um, very simple houses. Um, most of our backcountry settlers early on lived in two-room log houses with dirt floors. They might have owned 2,000 acres of land, but the houses were very simple. You didn't start seeing a lot of this real ornate, intricate uh, architecture, um, big, massive houses coming into place until that low country influence um, in the early, to early 1800s. Um, Andrew Pickens is a good example of, 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 of Scotch-Irish Presbyterian. He was very serious. He was very devout. Um, he really had no time for what they call vainglories, which were things of ease, things of comfort. Uh, they didn't have time for that back then. They, they were just making a, uh, existing from day to day in some cases. And they were very, had a very strong faith in God. Now, they weren't big church attenders because churches were few and far between. So these people were very faithful people. Uh, but as far as attending regular church services in the back country, it was not available to them like it was in the low country. You know, they couldn't just get in a creek and go to church by the tides. Um, so, you know, sometimes you had a family that might not go to church but once a month when the traveling circuit riding preacher came around. And sometimes these ministers were Presbyterian ministers, but they would also teach in Baptist churches or Methodist churches or you know, wherever. Um, they might teach, preach in one church on Sunday and one on Monday and one on Tuesday. Uh, but the people were hungry for, for the Word of God. That doesn't mean that they were devoutly behaved. There were tremendous problems in the upcountry, the backcountry with alcoholism, um, fighting, um, gambling, every sin and vice that plagues people today we had during that time period. So they were very devout people. They had strong beliefs, but they fell victim to the same things. And you look back through church records and you see the, the most prevalent thing that someone was churched for, or kicked out of church for, was partaking of strong drink and being drunk. So, um, like I said, people haven't changed. The same thing that plagued our ancestors are, are common in society today. I think they had a little bit more wife beating back then than we have now, um, unfortunately. Um, well, as a social historian, though, how did those mores kind of play out over the last century or so, last couple of centuries, that in business and education and other things? Well, I think, you know, part of South Carolina's conservatism, uh, the fact that we are a very conservative state, um, is based in the, the Christian values, the very conservative Christian values of our ancestors that have passed down through families. Um, you know, we, all those Protestant, and, and I say Protestant because South Carolina was almost entirely Protestant um, up until the 20th century. There were a few Roman Catholic churches, one in Charleston, um, especially with early St. Mary's. Uh, you had several towns that had Roman Catholic churches by the 1850s, but that Protestant Anglo-Saxon work ethic and conservative values, the, um, you know, save more than you earn, um, make something of yourself. Not that the Roman Catholics weren't like that, but that those Protestant work values, um, I think, have, at least into the generation we're in, um, persisted in the South. Um, because, you know, I've heard so many times in my life, idle hands are the devil's playground. Um, you know, if you're not working and producing, idleness brings upon uh, the opportunity for sin. And so I think a lot of those old Presbyterian beliefs that you always have to be working and accomplishing or else you're going to backslide or fall into sin uh, has sort of guided our work ethic in a lot of ways. And I think our conservative values and our, you know, our value for capitalism, our value for uh, independence, for um, personal freedom for land rights, all that comes directly from our British, uh, Scottish, English, Irish, 
French uh, ancestors that came over, over in the 1700s. And, you know, like I said, most of us as Southerners are descended from the oldest Americans. We are descended from the lineages that came here when America was first founded. And my grandmother said many times, our ancestors were not just immigrants, they were nation builders. And I think that attitude has come through a lot of families and you feel obligated because your ancestors were nation builders to carry on that tradition of success and building something during your lifetime that will outlast you. And family names were very important, what you had accomplished, what your grandfather had accomplished. You know, after the war between the states, everybody in the South pretty much was poor. You know, our families lost everything. You know, we are the, we are the victims of, of a conquest. We are the, our ancestors were the victims of uh, a federal government that came in and conquered them, but they were not victims long because that whole concept of victimization was not something that our ancestors believed counted for anything. You might have been a victim initially, but you took that and you made something out of it. And I think that perseverance, that um, stick to and you can see this in South Carolinians after hurricanes, after tornadoes, after floods, we're going to pick up going and make a, make a life again. We've got ourselves, we've got our religion, we've got our faith, we have our family, we can make it again. And I think that that type of thing has been passed down to us from our ancestors who were, who were bullheaded enough to leave oppression where they migrated from and found a new nation. And I think that, that's one, we're heirs to that as Southerners. Not that Northerners aren't, but especially as Southerners, we're heirs to that feeling of we're obligated to make something of ourselves and of our, of our state. You mentioned that it didn't stop anybody from sinning then or now. No, I had a friend no. who said that, that was, he was born in the late 1800s and he said it didn't stop us from sinning, it just kept us from enjoying it as much as some other parts of the country. Exactly, you might sin, but then you worry about it for two or three days afterwards. <laughs> Well, you, you remember, I don't know how many historic boards you're on. Is it three, four? How many? Um, one, two, three, four, five or six at this okay. time. Uh, what are some things that surprise people most when you get out and talk to them about history in South Carolina? Hmm. Surprise them the most. That South Carolinians um, in the backcountry were fairly well read. Being Presbyterian, they stressed the ability to read and write. So illiteracy rates among the white Presbyterian settler, settlers, the back, especially the men, um, was fairly high. Now, women were fairly illiterate because it was not seen uh, useful or purposeful for a lady to have the ability to read and write. So even in the wealthier families, sometimes your women did not read and write as much as men, but they did believe that men should have the ability to conduct business, to read, to write, and also to read the Bible and interpret the Bible for themselves. So I think that's another Presbyterian uh, belief that really has made a difference is that teaching the children to read and write, there, there were, on the larger plantations, there were academies. Uh, where a tutor was hired and even children from the adjoining plantations and farms could come. Uh, and if you didn't have that means, typically you taught your own children to read and write at some level. Um, so I think the fact that backcountry South Carolinians, upcountry South Carolinians, before the war between the states were fairly literate is a big surprise to a lot of folks. Uh, our literacy rate actually fell after the war between the states when people did not have the leisure to anymore to to do that. They had to just survive. Uh, so there was a period where a lot of people went to work for the cotton mills, and when the crops were failing, that you know, and because of war, that they didn't stress literacy as much. So you know, that generation that came up in the late 1800s was actually less literate than the generation that had preceded them in the 1830s to 1850s. Um, another thing I think that surprises people is just how hardy our ancestors were and how they could survive. I mean, they, they were in a wilderness, and you know, you come to a wilderness with basically an ox or a horse, a cart, an ax, and a few tools, and out of that you build a farmstead. Um, how many people could do that today? And I think the young people are especially surprised by, you know, you didn't just settle with everything you needed. You settled with very little, and then over time, you made what you had. You, were, you had to become self-sufficient. And, and if you didn't, you didn't survive. You, you moved on and went somewhere else. Or you became uh, a tenant or a, a hired hand of somebody else. But I guess the, the sheer determination 
um, and use of resources that they had that we, we've really lost. We, our, our society has lost, I think, the ability to survive like they did. I think if you put us in the woods with an ax and a pot, um, we'd probably starve to death. Need now. a cell phone to go with yep, it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Has uh, any, anything in your research surprised you that you, you didn't expect to find? Hmm. One thing that surprised me is how little property rights women had. Um, you know, we, we think of, of rights that females have now. Those are recently earned. Um, you know, you look back into earlier annals of history, and this is not just in South Carolina or the South, this was all over. Um, ladies pretty much were subject to the whims of their husbands, uh, socially and legally. Um, I don't believe a lady could own and transfer property on her own until the 1850s in South Carolina. Um, if a lady was going to buy property, oftentimes if she was a single lady, she had to have a broker to go do that for her. Um, it was, ladies could not write uh, under their own names. Uh, they had to publish under, under another name because it was improper for a lady to publish under her own name. They could not get involved in politics. Of course they couldn't vote. Um, and so, you know, some of the advances made by women in recent times, um, not that they, that they were not capable, they were very capable, they just were not allowed uh, in the old days. And I often tell people who want to go back they say, oh, it's such a romantic time, it's so, these old houses are so beautiful, it's such a wonderful thing to go back and live in the past. No, not really. You know, if you were white, male, and wealthy, it was a little bit easier. But you subtract any of those factors, and life was not fun. You know, if you were, if you were black, if you were uh, female, or if you were poor, um, it was a, a miserable lot in life in most cases. So, and even the white wealthy males had to deal with children and wives dying all the time from disease. Um, there were, you know, the life expectancy uh, in the up country was a bit better than the low country, but in the low country before the Revolutionary War, the life expectancy was barely 50 years of age. Um, and you were lucky if you made it to 50. So, um, you know, the, the nutrition was, was terrible in the old days. You know, the, the reason people were um, they weren't that much shorter than we are, that sort of a misconception. They were a bit shorter, but they were much more lithe, much more skinny, uh, much more slender because they just didn't have the nutrition. If you look at clothing that was worn by uh, a gentleman, uh, a grown gentleman in the 1830s, a 12-year-old boy now would have a hard time getting into it because they were so slender. Um, so you know the those types of things that we have basically benefited for this this sometimes too much nutrition uh, they just didn't have people had uh, diseases like pellagra uh, that was was um, due to a lack of niacin in the food lack of protein um, most women uh, except for the extremely wealthy that had access to lots of protein and calcium had lost their teeth by the time they were 25 years of age because of calcium loss in childbirth and, and nursing. Um, you had a lot of rickets, you had a lot of uh, consumption, tuberculosis, so the diseases were rampant. There really was no medical care. You had home medical care, which was a lot of folk medicine and superstition and things like sticking a knife under the bed to cut the pain for, uh, for, for birth. Um, you know, hanging an onion, onion around your neck to keep the, the flu or the cold away. Um, so it was, the medical care um, I've learned uh, was just it was less than substandard. It didn't exist really. Um, and a lot of it was superstition based. Any other superstitions that you come across oh, that seem really odd? Lots and lots of superstitions. Um, you know, the Scotch Irish, the Welsh, the English, uh, the Africans, the French, everybody had their superstitions, the Germans. Um, and a lot of it dealt with the supernatural. Uh, there was a strong belief in spirits the spirit world and ghosts and especially among the Africans, uh, you know, the what they called hoodoo or voodoo, which was voodoo in, in the Louisiana that area, they believed that the spirits could be manipulated against you to do things in the living world. Well, the, the, the white culture wasn't so much on that, but they believed in witches, they believed in werewolves, they believed in um, all sorts of demonic possessions, they believed, you know, anytime someone became ill, unexplained, they would oftentimes think that it was some sort of a demonic possession or that it was a witch working a spell on you. 
Now, witchcraft was not as taboo in South Carolina as it was in Boston or some of those places. Um, South Carolina is often where witches came, uh, or Virginia. Uh, they were much more tolerant. You didn't, they didn't really kill them here. Uh, but yeah, there were, there were people who believed that things were happening by witches. A lot of things were done, um, of course, by the signs. Um, uh, when you planted, when you operated, when you did anything, it was by the celestial signs. Um, and I believe there is some merit in that. You know, you look at the almanac and there's still people who plant on certain signs and things tend to do better. So I think those were, there was some merit in that. But um, a lot of superstitions that um, cause people to do things that we think are strange, sprinkling sand or salt across a doorway to keep evil spirits out. Uh, the bottle trees that we see, and those are even up here. Um, that was brought from Africa. It was believed that when you put brightly colored bottles on a tree, usually it was a branch in the yard, that when a spirit, an evil spirit, entered your dooryard, they would be attracted to that bottle and they would go inside of it and get trapped. The bottles always had to be uh, bottom up with the neck down. And so once that spirit was trapped, it couldn't get out. But you had to honor that spirit's ability to go back to its former realm. And so you would take it to the cemetery and you would break those bottles about once a year. So that's why you go to a lot of African-American cemeteries and you'll see bottle glass, broken bottles, because they're usually piles because they would break those bottles and go back home. Um, sweeping of yards was another thing because it was believed, it was practical too. But uh, that was brought from Africa, and you swept the yard so you could see snakes and vermin around the house, but also because you would sweep these designs, almost like these Zen garden designs in the dirt, because if an evil spirit approached your door at night, you should see the footprints of, of that spirit coming to your door. So they would sweep that out every day to sweep the footprints of the evil spirits out of the, the dooryard. Um, you know, painting, I don't know if you remember, but people painted the bases of trees white in the old days. In the south, you'd have a swept yard, and every tree in the yard, the pecan trees, would all be painted white. Well, that was brought from Africa, and that was done uh, over there to prevent the trees from getting termites in them. Uh, but then it was done here just by superstition uh, and, and for, for tradition. Um, you'll see to this day bags of water hanging in doorways, uh, sometimes in the low country. And uh, you'll say, well, why is that bag of water hanging? They'll try to tell you it's so flies won't come in. A bag of water will not keep flies out. That bag of water is because a spirit cannot cross, walk, cross water twice in the, the hoodoo belief. And uh, so if it crosses that water, it's trapped in your house. It can't go back to Bakulu, which is the, the water world. Um, there's a lot of African beliefs that have worked their way into, into superstitions. Um, you know, things like don't let somebody sweep under your feet or you'll never get married. Don't walk under a ladder. Don't don't step on a crack. Um, all these things, don't whistle in the house. Uh, one of the, the um, superstitions that still has a lot of merit now, and, and people still do it, funeral homes even, is you don't ever carry a body out of a house um, uh, head first because it can, the, the person can look back on the family and beckon them to follow them in death. Back in the old days, a lot of people died in epidemics. So you'd have one family member to die, then the rest of the family would die off. And so it was thought that that person's spirit was beckoning them to follow them. So right now, the, the coffins go out feet first. So you can't look back into the household and beckon someone to follow you in death. Um, so those things are still done. Um, you know, when somebody died, they covered mirrors and looking glasses because they thought the spirit of that person would be trapped in it. They opened windows to let the spirit free. Um, lots of different things that surrounded death because death was such a part of everyday life. And so those spirit, the, those, those traditions and superstitions really got ingrained into the generation after generation. All things that would have John Calvin scratching his head. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And most of those superstitions came from you know, medieval and on farther back. Some of them are even Celtic. Uh, that that far back, um, yeah. and I know you know you do some popular ghost story talks too during that time of year. And um, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the other most common things people want you to come speak about? What do people want to hear about? Um, just general. I think people are very interested in cultural aspects of of South Carolina early on. Um, a lot of interest in the war between the states. Although I'm by no means an expert on that. Um, a lot of interest in the American Revolution and the early settlement period, um, early agriculture, um, building traditions, how, you know, actual structural composition of buildings, how you can determine the age of a building by the structural components, what's used, how the boards are sawn. Um, that's always real interesting to folks. Um, you know, I can look at a building and tell you 
pretty much on site how old it is within you know 50 years but it's just something you sort of develop the proportions uh, the construction techniques the fenestration of the windows the the materials are built off so those types of things are uh, interesting um, to folks uh, I do a talk on mourning customs and death and burial in the south um, that's a real popular one talking about the you know when somebody dies the stages of mourning the superstitions um, so that that's one that's real popular um, I really don't talk a whole lot on military battles because that's not my line of expertise. Um, I'll leave that to the, the battle historians, although I do enjoy studying about military, you know, the movements and the military actions. Uh, we wouldn't have been a free country without that, and we wouldn't have stayed a free country without that. Why do you think there's such a hunger for people to connect to the past and to learn all these things? You know, I think that young people oftentimes don't have that feeling because they're so caught up in today, which is good. But I think once somebody gets to be 40s, 50s, they start looking back more than forward. And I think when you start looking back, you want to know more whence you came, what made you who you are, why you are the way you are. Um, our families become more important as in the way of family traditions. And I think when people start really getting concerned about their families, they also get concerned about the larger, you know, spectrum of history. You know, why, where did my family migrate from? When did they get here? Um, what were they like? Um, did they have accomplishments that were significant? Um, you know, were they horse thieves? You know, you're always going to find a few of those. Those are the fun ones. You know, the ones that, the ones that didn't actually live by the rules are always the most fun ancestors to find. Um, so did I come from a long line of ministers or a long line of jailbirds? You know, a lot of people, you know, it seems that trends perpetuate through families sometimes, you know, and you can look back through some of these lineages and it's a long line of criminals, generation to generation. <laughs> and then some have long lines of preachers and farmers and planters and lawyers and doctors. It's just what's stress in the family. But, but I think that, um, you know, a lot of people truly are interested in history. They just don't have the time to explore it. And as we get older, I think, exploring our personal history and then as a product of that the larger history becomes more important to us. Where would you suggest people start if they're just starting to get interested in history and family history? Is there a good starting place or starting point? Well in Anderson the Genealogical Society has a tremendous resource for um, studying history. The Belton Museum has a genealogical room as well uh, if you're interested in your personal family history. Uh, the Pendleton um, it used to be Pendleton District Commission, now it's Lake Hartwell Country. Uh, at far, at uh, Hunter's store, they have a big collection of historical papers and documents. Anderson County Museum is a tremendous research um, engine. I mean, the, the, they've done a tremendous job in digitizing documents and photographs. And so that's probably one of the best, they, they have a genealogy room, the, the Donna Roper, I think Donna Roper Genealogy Room, really, really good genealogical resource. Of course, the State Archives and History, uh, State Genealogical Society. Uh, every, every area, every district has a genealogical society, so I'd encourage people to get interested, to get involved with that if you're interested in your own family history and own genealogy, because there are people who have done years of work who would love to help you find, uh, find your ancestors and find out about your history. Um, for people who have moved in here more recently, um, you know, it, there's not really a whole lot here for them to research. They would have to go back to their own home state or whatever. Um, and, you know, South Carolinians are lucky because most of us who are native to South Carolina have families that stretch back in this state to 300, 350 years. You can find at least some ancestor. Whether you're, you're black or white, you can find some ancestor that goes back that far. Now, African Americans have a more difficult time. Uh, a, tremendously difficult time oftentimes going back before about 1920 uh, because there really were no public records kept of anybody before that point. Um, but the white churches and because they were property owners, they kept, you have property records, probate records, wills, documents. A lot of your African Americans don't have that. So unless they go back to a plantation register or something, uh, it's difficult to find names. We actually have a, a, a plan to a farm register here at Woodburn that when Dr. John Bailey Adger moved here uh, from Charleston and set up Woodburn Farm, he brought with him nine servants from Charleston that his wife had inherited. 
Uh, there's a long story there, interesting how he, he never wanted to own slaves. He went into the ministry. His wife inherited slaves. They didn't want to sell them, so they came back to Charleston from Armenia, uh, actually set up a school and a church for uh, enslaved and free blacks in Charleston, came up here. He brought his wife's servants with them and quickly found out that you did need somebody to work on a farm. So uh, he was a very benevolent slaveholder from everything we've been able to find. But we do have the original register with the names of Dr. Adger's slaves in it. Um, those types of things can be a great resource for African Americans who are searching their ancestry. Um, you know, there really were no birth certificates or death certificates before early 20th century for anybody. Uh, and if you come from a line of people who were illiterate, it's very difficult because you didn't keep family Bibles. And so there are a lot of white people who have a hard time whose families might have been illiterate or not well-to-do going back before the uh, turn of the 20th century as well. Um, but there are lots of resources. There are lots of people who are there to love to help you, uh, others find out uh, their answers. A really good, another good one that just came to mind, a tremendously good research room is the Faith Clayton Library at Southern Wesleyan University. Ann Sheriff there uh, has done a tremendous job with the genealogical records, the Bibles, the documents, and so that's a good resource for everybody who's wanting to look into their uh, genealogy and history in this area and just general history of the communities. Well, um, since we're sitting here, where are there some places they should visit just to kind of get a general feel for the well, I see the places that are open to the public in, in Anderson County are Woodburn and Ashtabula, um, open every week during the summer. Um, you've got your Haygood Malden House in Pickens. It's another really good, uh, it give you a good example of an 1850s house that's furnished to the period. It's got some magnificent collection. Anderson County Museum, of course, is wonderful. Pickens County Museum, uh, Belton Museum, and um, there's so many different museums. The, the Upcountry Museum in Greenville. Um, is, is a good resource. Um, but I would say look to your communities for the small, the South Carolina Agricultural Museums right here in Pendleton. Uh, if you're interested in agriculture, it's a tremendous resource for both historical information and a lot of interactive things for young people. And that, to me, that's the most important thing. Those of us who love history, the most important thing is to instill a love of history into folks when they're young, when they're children. Because if you don't have an interest or a love in history when you're a child, chances are you never will. And so for families who are interested in history, I say take the children out. Take them on these history experiences. Take them uh, hiking to historic sites. One of the greatest national historic sites we've got in South Carolina that's close by is the uh, Star Fort in 96. It's the best preserved Revolutionary War earthwork in the southeast, and it's right here in our own backyard. Uh, they tell the entire story of uh, the siege and the Battle of Star Fort. It was a pivotal point in the American Revolution early on. Uh, it tells, talks about the migration of the Loyalists to Canada. I mean, all sorts of things that you can learn right around us. Uh, and I would say go to the web and search or word of mouth or go to somewhere like Anderson County Museum and they have, they could tell you where to go, um, give you resources of places to go and things to see. <laughs> Thank you.